Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A few months ago, a pastor friend of mine said something that at the time I didn't really agree with. He said, we Christians talk an awful lot about going to heaven and being in heaven, but we seem to have forgotten about the resurrection of the body. My first thought to his statement was, what do you mean? We confess the resurrection of the body each and every time we say the creed. But you know, over the last few months, as I paid closer attention to sermons I heard, sermons I wrote and preached, and how we Christian people generally talk about life and death, I discovered that that pastor was pretty much right. There was an awful lot of talk about going to heaven, about being in heaven, about having heaven as our home, but hardly any mention of the resurrection of our bodies. I suppose it's a good thing then that this Easter season lasts for several weeks following the resurrection of our Lord, and that throughout these weeks in this Easter season, the Bible readings that we are presented with have subtle but also prevailing instances where Jesus proves that he does indeed have a real, human, and living body. These details in the text are brief. They seem almost secondary, almost like an afterthought to what we may think is the point of the account. But if you look at them closely, they are certainly there. And when you consider what they mean, they're really quite amazing. Consider our reading for today. In the Gospel, Jesus again appears to his disciples. This time, while two of them were reporting to the others how they had just seen Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Jesus appears to all of them, and they are all frightened because they think that he is a ghost. Jesus then makes a point of showing them both his hands and his feet in order to prove to them that he is indeed real flesh and blood. The disciples marvel, but are still not completely convinced. So according to the gospel text, Jesus casually asks them, do you have anything to eat? And Luke casually records that they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in front of them. It's such a simple detail. He took a piece of fish, and he ate it. Yet it shows us that Jesus does indeed have a whole, a healthy, and yes, even a physical body. Such little details are littered throughout the resurrection accounts in the Bible. When Mary Magdalene meets Jesus in the garden on that Easter morn, he actually has to tell her, do not cling to me, but go and tell the others what you have seen. You cannot cling to a ghost or an apparition. You cannot grab hold and embrace someone who does not have a real physical body. <coughs> Then if you remember just last week, we heard about Doubting Thomas, the one who put his finger into the scars of Jesus, again proving that Jesus' body was real. When Jesus appears to his disciples that are fishing on the Sea of Galilee, he makes them breakfast on the shore and again eats right in front of them. Likewise, to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus ate with them before he disappeared from their sight. Imagine what those two disciples sitting at table with God from Jesus, who has now just disappeared from sight, how they too must have thought that they had seen a ghost. But proof to the contrary sat right across from them, a half-eaten crust of bread on a plate, an empty glass of wine sitting next to them. And also, as they walked on that seven-mile journey through Emmaus, I wonder how many times that they nudged that strange but familiar man as they talked. How they might have clapped him on the shoulder as they made a joke or laughed about something funny. How they might have brushed up against him as they avoided the puddles in the road, or even if they shook hands when they talk about parting ways. You see, you can't do any of those things with someone who is only an apparition or only has a spiritual essence. Throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospels following the resurrection, we see that Jesus does indeed have a real physical body. And when we notice those details in the gospel stories, we actually see that Jesus goes to a lot of trouble to show us 
that he is living in both body and in soul. Why is that? It's because our bodies matter. If we are indeed to follow where Christ has led, and that promise extends through the grave and on into eternity, we know then that we too will also receive resurrected and perfected bodies. Death is nothing but the separation of the soul from the body. After that separation, the spirits of the faithful reside with Christ in a state that we often simply refer to as being in heaven. But our salvation does not solely consist in being with Christ or with God in some sort of spiritual sense. We believe and we confess that Jesus will indeed return to the earth to judge the living and the dead, and when he returns, he will raise the bodies of the dead. He will reunite them with the souls, and the faithful will inhabit a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity with the God who had created and redeemed them. It is for this reason that our bodies do indeed matter. Matter so much, in fact, that our God preserves them, raises them from the dead, perfects them, and then returns them back to us to inhabit forever and ever. So if our bodies matter that much, it also matters then what we do with those bodies. Yes, we all know diet and exercise. And that's part of being a good steward of the body that God has given us. Most of us are familiar with the verse from 1 Corinthians 6, which talks about how our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and that we should indeed take care of them. Yet, such clean living will still never save you from death. Even the healthiest body is still riddled with sin. And when it comes to sin, it's actually the sins against the body that God particularly warns us about. Things like suicide, murder, adultery. These sins are recognizable even to non-Christians, and we Christians memorize them as part of those almighty Ten Commandments. But we also cannot ignore the fact that above and beyond those Ten Commandments, the Bible also warns us specifically against sexual sins. Again, from 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have received from God? For you are not your own, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. If you look around, you'll notice that our lives are saturated with sexual sin. You name it, and we can readily find it. In fact, it's awfully hard to escape. And given the biblical, biblical warnings against it, it's no wonder that the devil spends so much of his time working and tempting in this area. We all know someone who has been broken by sexual sin in one way or another. And I'd say that for most of us, all we have to do is really just look in the mirror. But even if our bodies are long past the time when hormones and health would allow us to act upon such lustful temptations, the mind is always spry and salacious when it comes to sin. Even when sex no longer excites, we can easily replace it with malice or jealousy, gossip, coveting, or any other number of sins, and we can find the results just as deadly to our body and to our soul. For all sin brings nothing but condemnation and death. But dear friends in Christ Jesus, this condemnation and death are not your future. As dominant and widespread as, as sin is in our world and even in our lives, we were created and have been redeemed to be something completely different. So when you look in the mirror in the morning and you see all that is wrong with your life, when you even see the wrinkles and the gray hair and realize that these are the consequences of your own sin, even when the lures of the devil continually pull your body into places where your spirit doesn't want to go, into places and activities that you regret, things that you wish you could change about yourself, 
even in the midst of these sins, you can still rejoice in knowing that there is a God who became flesh for you. A real God who became a real man so that he would deliver us from this body of death we inhabit. A real Savior for you who bought you with a price, bought you completely, both body and soul. You see, when you hear these accounts of Jesus after his resurrection, you are glimpsing your own future. A future where the sins that have defined you, perhaps for a very long time, have no more meaning upon you. A future where accident or amputation, where mutilation or malformation, birth defect or genetic disease, biological, psychological, physiological, confusion or corruption, all have no more effect upon who you are for all eternity. For when Christ comes again, you will be as he intended you to be. Perfect, whole, healthy, without sin, full of life, and life for eternity. Such things perhaps sound too good to be true, especially to those of us who still struggle in bodies that don't seem to get any better. Those of us whose years keep getting shorter and whose list of ailments continues to get longer. Seems too good to be true to those of us who have lost pieces of ourselves to sickness or given pieces of ourselves away in sinful vices. It all sounds too good to be true. And yet, the proof is always in the eating. Christ promised a bodily resurrection from the dead. And to prove it, he took a piece of fish and he ate it before his disciples. To you, Christ has promised forgiveness for all of your sins, of both body and mind. And to prove it, he has given you his body and blood to eat and to drink. To you, Christ has promised the same resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come, and as proof of that, he here sets his table to dine with you, his very disciples. It is in this place and in places like it all over the world that Christ sets out heavenly food for heavenly guests for their heavenly future. And all of that is to say that your body matters. Your life matters. Matters so much that Christ redeemed it with his own. As strange as it might sound to us, you are an eternal being. Right here, right now, you will indeed live forever. In fact, everyone that you ever meet is also an eternal being. It just depends upon where you're spending that eternity. Without Christ, that prospect is a dreadful one. An eternity of getting older. An eternity of nothing but progressive dying and dealing with sin, death, guilt, and shame apart from any love of our God. We call that place simply hell. But with Christ, such an eternity is the epitome of joy. Endless days of healthy bodies that work better than we ever imagined, minds that are clearer than ever before, an eternity of being with our God face to face, without sin, shame, or vice ever entering into our thoughts, words, or deeds. Such is the eternal life promised and delivered by our Lord and Savior. And we often simply just call it heaven, but in fact it encompasses so much more than that. It is important that we Christians talk about heaven. It's also important that we also talk about the resurrection of the body. Heaven is simply being with our Lord. While we are here on earth, that happens whenever we hear his word and receive his sacraments. And then when we die, our souls rest with Christ, while our bodies rest here. But when Christ returns, both body and soul will be brought back together for all eternity. And that body will be yours. It will not be some strange vehicle that is unfamiliar to you or those who knew you. For God had created you to be you, had created that body to be yours, redeemed it to be yours. 
And while he will indeed glorify it to be like his in holiness and righteousness and life, it will still be yours, and it will be yours forever. And to those of you who are curious, yes, we may also infer, according to God's word, that there will also be copious amounts of eating and drinking, feasting and celebrating in that eternal life. For God has indeed created us for life. God has created us for joy, both in body and in soul. And Christ does indeed deliver, in flesh and blood, the promises and the redemption that he has prepared for you. And it is yours, both now and for all eternity. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.